Slow Path to Peace, book two in the Sunburned Land series, written by Juliet Duncan, narrated by Sarah Kennedy. Chapters 11 to 20. Chapter 11. Maggie shielded her eyes from the sun as she and Frank strolled along Cable Beach, hand in hand. Their honeymoon had been everything she'd hoped for and more. Broome, on the northwest coast of Western Australia, was quiet at this time of year. During the dry months, the town's population swelled from just over 15,000 to more than 45,000 when tourists from all around the world flocked there to enjoy the delights the town offered. But now, in the middle of the wet season, they were able to enjoy it without the crowds. They were both used to the afternoon storms and the threat of cyclones, so it didn't overly bother them. When it rained, they simply ran for shelter or stayed put and got wet. Their oceanfront villa in the Cable Beach Seaside Resort was luxurious and relaxing. The grounds were filled with fragrant frangipani trees, pandanus palms and boabs, and boasted several casual to chic restaurants with wide verandas to catch the breeze a number of bars and cafes, as well as two huge pools, a day spa, and an impressive collection of art. Maggie thought it would be wonderful if Bethany could get some of her paintings displayed there. She glanced up at Frank and her heart warmed. This time away was just what they needed. But it was too short. Soon they'd be back at the station, dealing with all the challenges life was throwing their way. But she didn't want to think about them right now. A penny for your thoughts? Frank stopped and faced her, his hands gently rubbing her arms as he gazed into her eyes. She chuckled as a grin spread across her face. I was just thinking how much I love you. I thought that's what might have been on your mind. His eyes twinkled as he lowered his face and hungrily covered her mouth with his. She locked herself into his embrace, enjoying the feel of his arms around her and the touch of his lips on hers. She didn't notice that the sun had disappeared behind a big black cloud until drops of rain fell on her head. I think we're going to get wet, she whispered in between kisses. Frank laughed as he continued to kiss her. (laughs) Just as well I brought an umbrella. She snuggled closer as he opened it. Maggie celebrated her 60th birthday the following day, starting with breakfast in bed followed by a wonderful three hours being spoiled in the day spa. When she emerged, she felt like a new woman and floated through the rest of the day. Frank had booked a table at the exclusive Sunset Restaurant for dinner, and they enjoyed a sumptuous seafood meal while watching the sunset slowly across the ocean, casting a beautiful orange glow across the water. After they finished eating, Frank took a small, gift-wrapped package from his pocket and handed it to her. For you, my darling. Maggie frowned. You've already given me a gift, the day spa. Open it, this is special. Her curiosity peaked. Maggie took the package and carefully unwrapped it. Her eyes widened. The box contained the most beautiful pearl pendant she'd ever seen. Frank, it's gorgeous. A pleased grin spread across his face. Take it out. She carefully lifted the pendant from the box and admired it. The pearl was an Australian South Sea pearl, the most revered and highly prized pearl in the world, and was absolutely exquisite. Oh, it's beautiful, Frank, thank you. You're most welcome, Maggie. Happy birthday. Thank you, it's been the best birthday I've ever had. Turning 60 hasn't been that bad after all then? Thanks to you, no. Smiling, she reached out and took his hand, meeting his gaze. I feel very blessed to be married to you, Frank. And I can't wait to see what the future holds for us. Hopefully a lot more birthdays. She laughed. (laughs) That would be a good start. Yes, and there's no one I'd rather share them with than you. Nor me, you. She exhaled a long sigh of contentment as their gazes held. It had been a slow journey to get here, but deep joy bubbled inside her, and she couldn't be happier. Chapter 12 
Returning to Goddard Downs after their two-week honeymoon was like coming back to Earth with a thud. How Maggie wished she and Frank could have stayed forever in the idyllic seaside town of Broome, where the troubles they'd left behind had faded a little with each passing day as the two of them had fallen further and further in love. But now, as the small plane descended towards Kununurra Airport, Maggie wondered what awaited them. Her daughter Serena was very much on her heart and mind, and while she'd prayed every day for her, Maggie didn't know whether she was still at Goddard Downs or whether she'd returned to Darwin. Maggie had also prayed daily for David, Serena's ex-partner, and that their unexpected breakup the night before Maggie and Frank's wedding hadn't sent him into a tailspin. Cliff, Maggie's ex-husband, also weighed heavily on her mind. Before she and Frank left for their honeymoon, She'd gathered something was afoot with him, but didn't pursue it. She hadn't wanted to. But now, she couldn't help but think of him. Jeremy, her adult son who lived in Darwin, had promised to look out for both Cliff and David, but that was a huge responsibility when he had two small children of his own to care for. She also wondered how the plans for the tourism venture were coming along. Would the overnight cattle drives and the eco-tents be enough to save Goddard Downs following the ban on live cattle exports? She and Frank had purposefully avoided talking about these matters while on their honeymoon after committing them all to God, but now they would be facing them afresh. She also knew that handing over the reins of Goddard Downs to Julian, his eldest son, was causing Frank some anxiety. He'd said he was happy to take a step back, but Maggie sensed he wasn't completely ready. Leaning across her, he glanced out the window before grinning and stealing a kiss. Are you ready to go home, my love? As he searched her eyes, her insides went to jelly like they always did whenever he looked at her with his pale blue eyes, she could lose herself in forever. She gave a small smile and shifted in the seat, tearing her gaze from his to stare out the window. For the last 40 years or more, home for her had been Darwin, Australia's northernmost city. Her new home was Goddard Downs, the cattle station that had been in Frank's family for four generations and was more than a thousand kilometres from Darwin. It was remote and almost totally inaccessible by road during the wet season. Their nearest neighbours were several hours' drive away. Their main means of transport during the wet season was helicopter although they could catch a ride on the mail plane once a week if there was room, or head up to the tiny port town of Wyndham via a back road if they were desperate. They stockpiled supplies during the dry season because running out during the wet season was not only inconvenient, but expensive. They slaughtered their own beef, pigs and poultry, so there was always plenty of meat, and they grew most of their own vegetables. She'd stayed there for six weeks as a guest prior to their wedding, but now she was arriving as the wife of the owner. Was she ready? She swung her gaze back to his and looked into the eyes she'd come to know and love. Eyes that were clear, honest and trustworthy. Was she ready? Other than one incident with Julian, she'd felt loved and accepted by the family. But would anything change now that she was married to the current patriarch? She had no intention of taking over the running of the homestead. She and Frank would live in the log cabin beside the lagoon, half a kilometre away. Janella, Julian's wife, and Olivia, Frank's daughter, were both capable young women, and she wouldn't dare intrude unless invited. There was nothing to worry about, and yet, a small sense of unease filled her. But there was no need to concern Frank. It was simply insecurity from her days married to Cliff, rearing its head. She recalled the passage from Colossians chapter 3 that Olivia read at their wedding. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. That would be her mantra going forward. She would clothe herself with compassion and kindness. She would be humble and gentle. 
and she would love Frank's family as her own. Because that's what they were now. Her family. She smiled at him and simply replied, Yes. Julian greeted them at the airport, and after hugs and kisses, Maggie and Frank collected their bags and hurried to the helicopter pad where the Goddard Downs helicopter awaited them. It was mid-afternoon and a large bank of menacing clouds was rapidly approaching from the east. I hope we can outfly that, son, Frank said. Do you think we should wait until it passes? Julian frowned. Where have you been, Dad? That's not going to pass. It's the low from Cyclone Lily coming our way. Oh, I didn't know. We'd better hurry. Maggie listened to the exchange between the two and tried not to grow concerned as she clambered inside the helicopter. Frank ushered her into the front seat beside Julian, then he jumped in the back. She wasn't sure where she'd rather be. Up front, where she could see the storm clouds brewing, or in the back, where she could close her eyes and zone out. But it was too late to choose. Julian had started the engine and was awaiting instructions. She figured they wouldn't be allowed to take off if it was deemed unsafe, and that gave her a level of comfort. But the menacing clouds loomed closer every second. They'd be flying away from them, but she doubted they'd be airborne before the rain started. She was right. Moments later, heavy drops sploshed on the windscreen, and within seconds, the rain was so heavy she could barely see the terminal. The noise was deafening. Neither Julian nor Frank seemed perturbed, or if they were, they hid it well. Julian received the all clear and prepared for takeoff, and within moments, the helicopter was airborne. Frozen in her seat, Maggie held her breath. She'd flown in helicopters and small planes before, but never in bad weather. She trusted Julian, but her heart pounded. In an attempt to calm it, she took some deep breaths and prayed. It was all she could do. The wind buffeted the helicopter, and for a moment she thought they were going down. But then it broke through the clouds into glorious sunshine and relief flowed through her veins. She breathed easy and her body relaxed. The flight to Goddard Downs was a short one, less than half an hour, but the landscape below was breathtaking. Red and ochre ancient rock formations and dark, jagged outlines of ridges and plateaus framed the vast savannah plains. It was rugged country, but it was beautiful. The old river had burst its banks, and the low-lying land now looked like an inland sea. Goddard Downs came into view. Sprawled over 150,000 acres, the station was huge and spread further than the eye could see. But it wasn't as huge as some. Nearby Bullo River Station was over 500,000 acres. This was now her home. Although Maggie had been raised on a station, it had been much smaller and not nearly so remote. She wondered briefly what the years ahead would bring. She and Frank had vowed to love and cherish each other in sickness and in health, for richer or poorer, until death did they part. Neither was young, but God willing, they had plenty of years left to enjoy together. But no one knew what lay in their future. Only God was privy to that information. Whatever lay ahead, he would be with them and would uphold and sustain them, because that was his promise to his children. The homestead came into view, drawing Maggie from her reverie. Frank must have sensed her anxiety when Julian steered the helicopter towards the pad because he reached forward and gave her shoulder a squeeze. She lifted a hand and placed it over his, drawing comfort. The helicopter descended and came to a stop, and as the whirring subsided, she turned around and briefly caught his gaze. Julian jumped out and Frank did likewise, offering his hand to help her down. Being short made anything like this difficult, but she didn't mind, especially when Frank caught her in his arms and kissed her before setting her safely on the ground. Julian strode to the shed and returned with the quad bike. He and Frank transferred their luggage from the helicopter to the bike, and then they all climbed in. Maggie once again sat in the front beside Julian for the short ride. The girls are preparing a welcome home dinner, 
he said as he steered the quad in the direction of the cabin. That's nice of them, Maggie said, smiling. What time are we expected? About six. That should give you enough time to freshen up. That's more than enough time. Is Serena still here? She tried not to allow her anxiety to show in her voice. Julian faced her, his expression blank, and Maggie wondered if there was a problem. Yes, but she's been looking forward to you coming back. Maggie studied him carefully, trying to read between the lines. Something seemed afoot, but she wasn't sure what. She smiled and turned her gaze to the front. Whatever it was, she'd find out shortly. With Serena and David broken up, Maggie expected she'd take over the role of Serena's main carer, but was unsure how that would work with her being newly married. Frank would understand, of course, but it could place a strain on their relationship. She prayed it wouldn't and trusted God to figure it out. When Julian pulled up outside the cabin, Maggie had a flashback of her first visit to Goddard Downs less than a year ago, and how gobsmacked she'd been when Olivia had brought her down here. She'd expected a simple cabin with basic facilities, not this gorgeous log cabin with a wraparound veranda and a clear view to the lagoon. How many times since then had she sat on one of the rockers, simply enjoying the view while she was meant to be working? She imagined that she and Frank would make full use of the rockers in the days and weeks to come. Frank jumped down and extended his hand to her, a broad grin on his face. She took his hand and carefully climbed out. Julian had already placed their luggage on the veranda and was back in the driver's seat. See you tonight. He tipped his hat and sped off. Left alone, Frank slipped his arms around her and lowered his mouth towards hers. Home sweet home, he whispered between kisses. Laughing, she kissed him back. She would never get enough of Frank Goddard. How blessed she was to have him as her husband especially after her disastrous marriage to Cliff. Taking her by surprise, Frank swept her into his arms and carried her up the stairs like a man half his 62 years. Frank, what are you doing? I'm carrying you over the threshold, that's what I'm doing. She laughed again before he set her down on the highly polished timber floor. Their gazes met and held, and for a moment, time stood still. Her heart beat faster as he closed the gap between them and enveloped her in his arms. Arms that made her feel safe, secure, loved. She tipped her head and gazed into his eyes. I love you, Frank. And I love you right back. Lowering his mouth, he brushed his lips gently across hers. How much time have we got? She chuckled. (laughs) Not enough for what you're thinking. His bottom lip protruded in a pout. I guess we'll have to wait until later. Yes, we can't be late for dinner. Planting a kiss on his lips, she ducked under his arms and grinned. Dibs on first shower? From memory, I think it's big enough for two. Frank, behave! His shoulders drooped. All right, if I must. (laughs) You must, she chuckled and then looked around. Why don't you make yourself useful and grab our bags? Oh, right, I'd forgotten about them. I thought so. She shook her head and laughed. Once the bags were inside, Maggie followed Frank up the stairs to the master suite, a loft-like room that took up the entire floor. With windows on every side, it offered a panoramic view that Maggie would never tire of. She loved waking up in the king-sized bed overlooking the lagoon. Now she'd love it more because she'd be waking up with Frank beside her. I think I'll take a bath, she said, walking over to the west-facing window and gazing out. Well, I know for a fact that bath's big enough for two, Frank said, setting the bags down. His father had spared no expense when he built the cabin for his bride many years earlier, and it had taken six men to haul the giant porcelain clawfoot tub through the window. You don't give up easily, do you? Turning, she slipped her arms around his waist and lifted her palm to his cheek. We'll have plenty of time later, okay? He smiled and covered her hand with his before gently kissing her palm. I guess I'll have to be happy with that. Good. Now, 
We run the risk of being late for dinner, so on second thought, I'll take a shower and save the bath for another day. Chapter 14 Instead of taking the quad bike that had been left for them outside the cabin, Frank and Maggie decided to walk the short distance to the homestead for their welcome home dinner. The rain they'd flown through in Kununurra hadn't reached Goddard Downs, and the sky was a deep, gorgeous blue. The stifling heat of the day had subsided, making it the perfect time for a leisurely stroll. Frank took her hand as they headed along the gravel track bordered by weeping paper barks and Livestona palms. I guess this means our honeymoon is officially over, she said. He slipped his arm around her shoulders and kissed the top of her head. I guess so, but I'll never forget it, my love. She put her arm around his waist. Neither will I. It was the best two weeks of my life. It was special. Maybe we can go back every year on our anniversary. She smiled. That's a wonderful idea. I'd love to do that. Well, we'll see what we can do about it. I guess it depends on how everything is doing here, she said, trying to match her stride to his, although he was already walking slowly. Yes, it does. He let out a heavy sigh. I'm not convinced the cattle drives and eco-tents are going to be enough to get us through. Julian found a buyer for that last shipment of cattle, but it only just covered costs. I'm praying the government will lift the ban on live exports sometime soon, but I don't see that happening for a while. Maggie frowned. But you weren't granted the stay for the licensing requirements. No, but the silver lining with the ban is that it's given us time to get things in order. We should be ready to go whenever the ban's lifted. Without the need to bribe that officer. Yes, without the need for any bribes, not that I would have considered it. I know you wouldn't, my love. Have you thought any further about reporting him? What was his name? Shepherd? Yes, that's him. Frank drew a slow breath. I truly doubt it would go anywhere. If we reported him, there's no proof he tried to bribe me. But he might have tried it with others. I guess that's possible. I'll ask around if I get the chance. They continued in silence for a few moments. A flock of white cockatoos flew across in front of them and settled onto a branch of a paperbark tree. Somewhere, a kookaburra laughed. It might not be broom with its endless white sandy beach, but this was home, and she loved it. They turned a corner in the homestead, a large old home shaded by eucalyptus and bauhinias came into view. Frank rubbed her arm. Here we are, my love. Are you ready? She inhaled slowly and smiled. Yes, Frank knew the family had planned more than a simple welcome home dinner. Julian had told him they were throwing Maggie a surprise birthday party and he couldn't have been more pleased. He sensed Maggie was a little anxious about how she'd be received by the family, although she hadn't said so. She didn't have to. He could read her like a book. He hoped the surprise party would set her at ease, because as far as he knew, the whole family was delighted she was now part of the Goddard clan. She was now Maggie Goddard. He liked the sound of that. As he smiled, his heart warmed. She was the best thing that had happened to him in a long time, and perhaps ever. As they approached the homestead, there was no hint of a party. In fact, it seemed unusually quiet. But when they reached the bottom of the stairs, Izzy, his three-year-old granddaughter, appeared at the top, her blue eyes lighting up. She raced down the steps, her wavy blonde hair bouncing on her shoulders and launched herself at him. Grandpa, you're home! He laughed as he picked her up and hugged her. Oh, yes, Izzy, we're home. <laughs> oh, it's good to see you. Have you been a good girl for mummy while we've been away? Yes, and I've been helping with her. She slapped a hand over her mouth, stifling a giggle as she looked at Maggie, her eyes wide. He laughed again and hugged her tightly. <laughs> it's okay, sweetie. You can tell me later what you've been doing. Now, are you going to give Maggie a hug too? He set her down on the ground. Izzy peered up at Maggie. 
what am I going to call you? Maggie smiled. My grandson calls me Nan. How does that sound? Sounds fine to me, she replied, reaching up for a hug. As Maggie met Frank's gaze briefly before bending down to hug his granddaughter, he winked. And when Izzy took both their hands and the trio walked up the stairs together, his heart warmed. He smiled over Izzy's head to Maggie as a deep sense of peace washed over him. But the peace was momentary. When they reached the back of the house, it was unusually quiet until the rest of his family jumped out from behind the furniture amidst shouts of, Happy birthday, Maggie! while blowing hooters and releasing party poppers that filled the room with colourful streamers and lots of laughter. Maggie faced him, her eyes bright. Did you know about this? He shrugged as a grin spread across his face. Oh, maybe. She chuckled and then began greeting his family in turn while he stood back and watched. Of course, the men folk were more reserved than the women. While she hugged Janella, Olivia and Sasha, his 11-year-old granddaughter, who each returned her hug with a big one of their own. The men simply gave her a quick hug and a peck on the cheek and then stood back. Caleb, who was now almost as tall as his father Julian, although much leaner, looked uncomfortable and awkward when she tried to hug him. But when she stepped back and smiled and said something Frank couldn't quite hear, Caleb seemed to relax. Considering what he'd been through, the boy was doing well, and Frank was looking forward to picking up their daily Bible reading sessions. But someone was missing. Where was Serena? Chapter 15 Facing the wall and curled in the fetal position, Serena lay on her bed with her eyes squeezed shut in an attempt to stem the flow of tears she hadn't been able to quell for some time. She should be out there celebrating her mother's birthday, but she couldn't face it. They'd all been so good to her over the past two weeks, Janella and Olivia in particular, but she felt flat, lost, empty. Several times she'd considered ending it all. What purpose was there in living? Her life as she knew it was over. There'd be no more jaunts around the world as a foreign correspondent. Who would want to see her disfigured face on their television? Danny, her station manager, had suggested she could write articles for their newspaper or take over the breakfast radio time slot when she was ready. He'd reassured her that the public would welcome her in whatever role she felt comfortable. But her energy was gone, and she had no interest in doing either. She wanted her old life back. It wasn't fair. If she'd suffered only a broken limb and some internal injuries, she would have been fine. She would have healed and life would have returned to normal. But her cheek, her cheek. She reached a hand up and felt it. Instead of smooth, healthy skin, it was rough, lumpy and horrid. Tears welled in her eyes and spilled over. She hated it. God, why did you let this happen to me? I hate you. I hate you. Her sobs grew into guttural weeping that came from a place deep inside. Do you know where Serena is? Maggie asked Janella quietly after the initial excitement had subsided and everyone began nibbling the delicious canapes laid out on the tables. Janella's expression sobered. In her room. She's not in a great way, Maggie. A small breath blew from Maggie's mouth and her stomach knotted. I guessed that when she wasn't here. Liv and I have done our best with her, but she seems to have slipped into a deep depression. I so hoped she'd turned a corner before we left. She must have been putting on a brave face so I wouldn't worry about her. Janella nodded, her warm brown eyes filling with empathy. I think you're right. Almost as soon as you left, she took to her room and she's hardly been out. Maggie grimaced. Oh dear. And David? As far as I know, she hasn't heard from him. Maggie drew a breath. I'll call Jeremy a little later and see if he knows anything. I'm so sorry, Maggie. We really wanted your homecoming to be a happy one. Rubbing Janella's arm, Maggie gave an appreciative smile. It is, Janella. I really appreciate you throwing this party for me. It's wonderful. It's just going to be a long journey for Serena, that's all. Thank you for looking after her. You're more than welcome. 
I only wish we could have done more. It's fine. There's probably not a lot anyone can do until she decides to do something for herself. You're probably right. It's just so sad seeing her this way. I know. Maggie let out a heavy sigh. I'll go and see her soon. She's in the guest room down the hallway. Dinner's in about 20 minutes, but have something to nibble and drink first. Thanks. It's a lovely spread, Janella. You're such a good cook. Janella smiled proudly. Thank you. Sasha helped, of course. I'll have to thank her as well. Janella's smile widened. She'd appreciate that. Frank approached and slipped a glass of fruit punch into Maggie's hand. Have this, my love. All you've been doing is talking. You must be dry. Accepting it gratefully, she smiled and took a sip. Thanks, this is just what I needed. He slipped an arm around her shoulders and kissed her lightly on the top of her head. You're welcome, my love. Looks like you two had a good time away, Janella said, her amused gaze shifting between them. He grinned. The best. Maggie leaned into him as memories of their honeymoon flashed through her mind, filling her with warmth. For a moment, she forgot about Serena. But then those memories faded and were replaced by images of her daughter lying on her bed and the moment passed. Tilting her face towards his, she said softly, Serena's not doing well. His expression stilled and grew serious. She'll do better now that you're here, my love. Maggie shrugged. Well, that's really kind, but I'm not so sure. I am, he said with confidence. She loved his confidence, but didn't share it. Only a touch from God would change Serena's heart and how she saw herself. Maggie could only pray that he would gently woo her back to himself that the eyes of her heart would open to his amazing love and grace, and that she wouldn't blame him for what had happened to her. As a young girl, Serena had given her heart to God and had been an ardent believer, but her faith had never been fully tested until she went to university and was faced with differing worldviews and belief systems. Maggie wasn't sure what her daughter believed anymore, but that didn't matter. The only way she would ever experience true peace was by returning to the God of peace. And that would require a shifting of her heart, a shifting that only the Holy Spirit could initiate. But in the meantime, she'd do what she could. But she sensed she was going to need a good measure of grace and God-given patience. She took another sip of her drink. I'll finish this and then go see her. Okay, my love, but don't miss dinner. It smells scrumptious. It sure does. Maggie turned to Janella. Can I smell a pig roasting? Janella nodded. Yes, the boys have been looking after the spit out the back. We're going to eat out there if the storm doesn't hit. We might be lucky, she said, glancing outside. Hopefully, Maggie said. Anyway, if you'll excuse me. Sure, go ahead. It would be nice if you could get her to join us. I'll do my best. Maggie smiled and then squeezed Frank's hand. I'll be back shortly. He bent down and kissed her lightly on the forehead. I'll be praying for you. Thank you. She gave another smile and handed him her empty glass before leaving him and walking down the hallway. As the noise faded behind her, she swallowed hard and reaching the guest room, she paused to pray. Lord, please give me the right words to say to Serena. My heart aches for her but I know that until she makes peace with you, she won't know true peace. Lord, please grant me wisdom. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Inhaling deeply, she knocked softly on the door. Serena, it's mum. Can I come in? Silence. She knocked again a little louder. Serena? No answer. Maggie quietly turned the handle and opened the door just enough to peer inside. Serena was curled on the bed with her face to the wall. Pain squeezed Maggie's heart. She pushed the door open further and walked quietly to the bed, and perching on the edge, placed her hand gently on Serena's back. Hey, sweetheart. I'm here. How are you doing? Serena shifted her shoulders slightly as if she was shrugging, but didn't turn around. No good. Her voice was raspy. Maggie guessed she'd been crying. 
Oh, you'll get through this, sweetheart. Let me give you a hug. She waited a moment, and just when she thought Serena wasn't going to move, she sat up and threw her arms around Maggie's neck and burst into tears. Not wanting to hurt her, Maggie held her gently and let her sob against her chest while she fought her own tears. Minutes passed. Sounds of laughter drifted in from the back of the house, along with the aroma of roasting pig. Eventually, Serena's sobs subsided, and Maggie handed her a tissue, which she took. She dabbed her eyes. I'm sorry, Mum. I can't seem to get out of this black hole I'm in. I think that's understandable, sweetie. You can't see past this, but you will in time. I'm here for you. I'll do whatever I can to help. Serena sniffed. Thank you, but I don't know what you can do. You can't give me my face back. Her words dropped like stones into the suddenly silent room. Maggie inhaled slowly, her heart filled with anguish. No, I can't do that. You're right. But what's inside you is more important than what you look like. Serena narrowed her eyes. It's easy for you to say that, Maggie grimaced. I know, but I mean it. They'd been through this countless times, and it took a measure of patience for her to bite her tongue. She didn't want to give Serena a sermon, so she simply hugged her and said, I love you, Serena, regardless of how you look. And so does God. Jesus had nail-scarred hands and knows what you're going through. Come on now, let's get you freshened up so you can join us for dinner. I'd rather not, Serena said, her gaze firm and steady. I can't make you come, Serena, but how long has it been since you were outside? Serena folded her arms. Days. Fresh air will do you good. Serena shrugged. I'm happy here. Maggie held her daughter's gaze. Are you? Her shoulders drooped and fresh tears pooled in her eyes. No. I thought as much. Maggie squeezed her shoulder. Come on, get dressed and come outside. You don't need to talk to anyone unless you want to. Seconds ticked by and Maggie prayed silently. Finally, Serena reluctantly agreed. But I'm only doing it for you. That's fine, at least you're doing it. What would you like to wear? Maggie stood and headed to the wardrobe. My clothes are in my suitcase. Right, of course. Serena had only come for the wedding, not an extended stay. Maggie changed direction and found the suitcase on the floor and opened it. From the way the clothes were folded neatly, she gathered Serena might have been in her pyjamas the whole time since the wedding. How long since you've showered? Serena shrugged offhandedly. Perhaps you should have one. You'll feel better, Maggie said softly. If you say so. The resigned, dull tone in Serena's voice tugged at Maggie's heart, but she forced herself to smile. Good girl. Now let me help you up. I don't need help. Okay, I'm sorry. Maggie stepped back and let Serena stand on her own, recalling that she'd told her David had treated her like a helpless child and she didn't like it. Maggie needed to remember that, but it was hard when Serena was acting like one. I can shower and dress on my own, she said, snatching the gown from the back of the door. All right, if you need any help, call. I'll be out the back, but I'll keep an ear open. Whatever, I won't be staying long. Maggie frowned. Do you mean at dinner or here? Both. Maggie's heart plummeted. Serena had always known how to pull her strings. The terrorist blast hadn't stolen that from her. Let's talk about it later, sweetheart, and sort out what to do. Are you sure you don't need any help? Maggie asked as Serena headed to the door. Turning slowly, Serena glared at her. Maggie groaned and stepped closer, rubbing her arm. Sorry, I forgot. Serena blew out a long breath and met her gaze. I'm sorry I was short. Tears sprang to Maggie's eyes. Come here, sweetheart. She held her arms out and Serena stepped into them. It'll be all right. Things will get better. Kissing the side of Serena's head, 
Maggie thought her heart would break. Although she was an adult, Serena was still her little girl, and Maggie's mother's heart wanted to make everything right for her. If she could, she would gladly swap places. I hope so, Serena whispered. Chapter 16 Maggie kept an eye on the back door, watching for Serena. Twenty minutes had passed since she'd left her to shower and dress, and she was beginning to think she'd changed her mind. She was about to check on her when the door opened and Serena appeared, wearing a caftan-type dress with Aboriginal markings on it. Not her usual style of clothing, but probably quite comfortable. Her hair had been singed in the fire and was now cut short all over. It had started to grow back, but there were a few bald patches Maggie guessed might always be there. Serena normally wore a scarf to cover the scars on her cheek, but tonight the scars were totally visible. Her cheek was discoloured and raw. Maggie could appreciate how difficult it was for Serena to show her face to the world. She stepped towards her and gave her a hug. You look lovely, sweetheart. You don't have to lie, Mum. I'm not. I love the caftan. The colours are lovely. Not to mention that they deflect attention from my face. Maggie smiled. Maybe. But you're among friends, Serena. No one is going to be bothered, honestly. Serena released a big sigh and glanced around. I know, but I can't help feeling self-conscious. I can understand that, but if people can't see past your scars, that's their problem. Serena swung her gaze back to Maggie. I'm not sure I can get used to people staring. Nobody's going to stare at you here, so let me get you a drink and something to nibble, although dinner's about to be served. Maggie steered her towards Frank, who was seated with Olivia underneath the shade of a eucalypt. She picked up a drink from a table and handed it to Serena. Here you go. It's the best punch I've tasted in a long time. Serena lifted a brow. I'd prefer something stronger. Maggie chuckled. I'm sure you would, but this is what's on offer. Reaching Frank and Olivia, she slipped her arm around Serena's waist. Look who's here. Frank stood and greeted Serena with a warm smile and a careful hug. Good to see you, Serena. Maggie was pleased when Serena replied in kind. It seemed the manners she'd been taught hadn't been lost in the blast. Olivia also gave her a hug and said it was good to see her up and about. I like the caftan, she said. Where did you get it? Serena glanced down and shrugged. At the markets, ages ago. I've not worn it before. Well, it's lovely. It must be cool. It feels nice on, floaty. She reached down and felt the fabric. It's different from the clothes I normally wear. Yes, I've seen you on the TV. You always look so smart. Serena's eyes flickered. Those days are gone. I'm so sorry. Olivia said, reaching her hand out. I didn't mean, it's okay. I'm just feeling sorry for myself. You're amongst friends here. I hope you know that. Serena nodded as tears welled in her eyes and she turned away. Maggie put her arm around her shoulders and stood with her. The sun was low on the horizon and the sky was now a glorious orange. The colours were so vibrant. Deep and rich, evoking emotion, pointing her to God the creator. She prayed silently that Serena might find him here in this remote, rugged, beautiful land, amongst this family who had known both hardship and joy, but had never doubted God's faithfulness. Behind them, Julian cleared his throat and called everyone to attention. Maggie turned and Serena did the same. He was standing beside the main table filled with platters overflowing with roasted pork and vegetables. For the first time, Maggie noticed how much alike he and Frank looked. Julian's hair was thicker, while Frank's was receding and thinning, but their profiles were the same. As was their stance. Casual, relaxed, hands in pockets. She hadn't seen Julian quite like this before. Janella was right. God had certainly been working in his life because he no longer seemed to be the angry man who'd challenged her on her first visit to the station. His gaze travelled around the group and then settled on her and Frank. Before we eat, I'd like to officially welcome back Dad and Maggie and also wish Maggie a happy birthday for yesterday. He raised his drink and said, cheers. 
Everybody followed suit. We hope you'll settle in quickly and that you'll be happy here. Maggie smiled and gave a grateful nod. Let's give thanks before we eat, he said to the group. When he bowed his head, Maggie shifted closer to Frank, slipped her hand into his and squeezed it. In the past, it had been his role as head of the household to give thanks. She sensed he might be struggling, although it wasn't the first time Julian had said grace. Nevertheless, she wanted to reassure him. When he squeezed her hand back, she sensed he was okay and she relaxed. When Julian finished, he announced that she and Frank should go first since they were the guests of honour. Frank placed his hand on the small of her back as they approached the table. Maggie turned to check on Serena and smiled. She was talking with Olivia and seemed happy enough. It was a start, although Maggie knew it could be a facade Serena was putting on, much like she'd done at the wedding. After filling their plates, Maggie and Frank sat at a long table covered with white tablecloths. As evening slowly descended, the lights strung between the branches came on, making it look like fairyland. With Serena on one side and Frank on the other, Maggie gazed around at her new family as they chatted and laughed together, and she thanked God once again for the many blessings he'd bestowed on her. After the main course, she was surprised when Janella brought out a huge birthday cake complete with candles that somehow remained lit while she walked from the house to the table. She set the cake in front of Maggie while everybody sang happy birthday. Leaning against Frank, she blinked back tears of happiness before blowing out the candles then realised a speech was expected. Drawing a slow breath, she stood and smiled at the expectant faces of the family. Unprepared, she took a moment to gather her thoughts before clearing her throat. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for making this evening so special. I had no idea you were planning this and I feel humbled by it. For a long time, the prospect of turning 60 had been daunting, but now I've realised it's just a number and that nothing has really changed. I'm still me, and although I might have a few more grey hairs than I had 10 years ago, I'm grateful for good health, a wonderful husband, and a family who's welcomed me with open arms. So thank you everyone, especially Janella, Olivia and Sasha for providing the amazing food, and of course the boys for cooking it on the spit. It was wonderful. Thank you. When she raised her glass, everyone clapped before she sat down. Frank slipped his arm around her shoulders and kissed her cheek. You did well, my love. Thank you. She gave him a smile. I guess I need to cut the cake now. Let me do that, Mum. Maggie's eyes widened. Had she heard correctly? Serena was offering to cut the cake. She blinked and then smiled. That would be great, sweetheart. Thank you. I need to do something. The cool tone in Serena's voice caused an ache to tear through Maggie's heart. No doubt she was feeling bad because she hadn't done anything for her birthday. Her focus had been on herself, no one else. Not even her mother's 60th. It didn't matter. Offering to cut the cake was a promising step. Maggie squeezed her wrist and smiled. I'm sure Janella has a knife. Right on cue, Janella appeared with a large knife and a number of small plates. Here we go. Serena took the knife and proceeded to cut the cake, a chocolate gâteau, complete with fresh cream and strawberries. Janella helped her to place the pieces on the plates and then handed them around, offering the first pieces to Frank and Maggie. The cake was rich but scrumptious. Maggie struggled to finish her piece but battled on since it was too good to leave. I'll put on weight if I'm not careful she said to Frank after setting her empty plate aside. Not much chance of that, my love, with what I've got planned for you. His eyes twinkled. She frowned. Like what? Oh, I can think of quite a few jobs around the place that will keep you active. Like helping with the fencing, you were great at that, he winked. I was not. My hands ached after only a few minutes. But you didn't give up. No, I didn't. I guess I could give it another try. Chuckling, he gave her a hug. <laughs> I was joking. <laughs> but seriously, I'll love you regardless of what you do or how you look. Their gazes held, and for a moment she forgot they were not alone. I love you, Frank, she said softly. He lifted his palm to her cheek and smiled into her eyes. 
I love you too. The moment was interrupted when Izzy tapped Maggie's arm and asked if she could sit on her lap. Maggie smiled. Sure, sweetheart. Izzy climbed up and leaned against her chest. Have you had a nice party? Maggie asked, cuddling the little girl. Izzy nodded. But I think I want to go to sleep soon. Maggie chuckled as she met Frank's gaze. It seemed Izzy was settling in for the evening. She was right. Within moments, her eyes had shut and her breathing had slowed. Maggie didn't mind. It was a precious moment that made her feel special. It was such a blessing to have gained four additional grandchildren. Her gaze shifted to Serena, who was now talking with Joshua and Sean, Frank's youngest son and a nephew of similar age. She wasn't sure how that had happened, but the trio was seated on chairs around a fire and seemed settled in for the evening. Considering how Serena had sustained her injuries, Maggie wondered how she was coping with the fire. She also wondered what the future held for her. Would she reconcile with David? It would be a pity if they didn't. He was such a nice man. She doubted Serena would ever have children. She'd always been adamant that she was a career woman and had no interest in a family. But now that her career may have ended, maybe that resolve would change too. Time would tell. Chapter 17 With Serena posted overseas for much of the year, David was used to spending time on his own. Whenever she returned, they picked up where they'd left off. But this time, it was different. She'd returned injured, and he'd smothered her. He knew he had, but he hadn't been able to stop himself. It was like a switch had been flicked inside him, and he'd gone into carer mode. He pushed harder up the hill. Cycling had become his escape since he'd left Serena the night before Maggie and Frank's wedding. When he'd driven all the way back to Darwin, stopping only long enough to refuel. Leaving had been a knee-jerk reaction after she turned down his proposal. A proposal that shouldn't have happened. What had he been thinking? She wasn't ready. He knew that, and now she wouldn't even talk to him. His breaths came faster and sweat poured off him as he crested the hill. Reaching East Point, he slowed and stopped. He usually kept going, but today he'd sit a while. He got off his bike and, grabbing his drink bottle, drank greedily. The air was heavy and humid, the light breeze barely providing any relief. Seated on the bench overlooking Fanny Bay, he pulled out his phone and checked for messages. Two missed calls from Jeremy. The guy didn't give up. He'd be calling to check on him, but David didn't want to speak to him. He didn't want anything more to do with Serena or her family. But that wasn't true. If there'd been a call or a message from her, he would have called her back immediately. Who was he kidding? He still loved her. Slamming his empty drink bottle onto the ground, he folded his arms and stared across the bay as a heavy, invisible weight crushed him. Why had he been so stupid? A few seconds later, another rider stopped nearby. Not wanting to talk to anybody, David kept his head low as he stood and scooped up his bottle and headed out to his bike. But a familiar voice calling out stopped him in his tracks. Thought it was you. You're a hard man to get hold of, David. His shoulders drooped. It was Jeremy of all people. How you doing, mate? Coming closer, Serena's older brother removed his helmet. Good, David lied. I don't believe you. Word around town is that you've become a loner. Better than turning to the bottle, David gave a pointed look. You've got that one right, Jeremy groaned. You've heard about Cliff? Sure have, he's made a mess of things all right. He'll do jail time if the girl dies. Cliff, Serena and Jeremy's father, had been involved in a hit and run, and the victim, a girl of only 10, was fighting for her life. He was on bail and due to face court the following week but the situation would change drastically if the girl didn't survive. So, how are you really doing? Jeremy sipped water from his drink bottle as the sun glistened on his damp, dark hair. David returned to the seat and flopped on it. Leaning forward on his crossed elbows, he stared across the bay. Honestly, not great. She does love you, you know. Straightening, he crossed his arms and faced Jeremy. She's got a great way of showing it. 
You should have heard what she said. Their last conversation reverberated in his brain like an echo that played over and over. Jeremy rolled his eyes. Oh, I can imagine. That sister of mine has an acid tongue at times. I know, I've borne the brunt of it, but she doesn't mean it. I'm not so sure about that. She was pretty adamant when she told me to pack my bags. Well, according to mum, she's not doing too well either. I wouldn't give up on her yet. David released a heavy breath. I've put in for a transfer. Really? Where to? Jeremy sat beside him. Anywhere. I need to get away. Maybe time away would do you good, although some might see it as running. David's eyes narrowed. I'm not running. Are you sure about that? Seconds passed. Yes. Stay then. David shrugged. I can't live in the same town as Serena if we're not together. It'll be harder to get her back if you're not here. David knew the truth of that. Maybe he should stay and fight for her. But after months of caring for her following the blast, when he'd willingly given everything up for her, only to have her throw it all back at him, he was tired. He'd pushed her too hard and now he'd lost her. I don't know, mate, I think I need to go, at least for a while. Jeremy remained silent for a moment and then said, Why don't you come around for dinner tonight? It's curry night, and I know how much you like a good hot curry. David thought about it for a moment, but then replied, It's tempting, but I'm on call tonight, sorry. Jeremy's brow lifted. Are you back at work? Yeah, there's no reason for me not to be working now. He was a firefighter and had taken indefinite leave to look after Serena. You can still come if you're on call. David groaned at the guy's persistence. I'll think about it. Good, but I'm guessing you're saying that to shut me up. You'd really be welcome, mate, so don't be a stranger. Just because my sister jerked you around doesn't mean we can't be friends. All right, I'll think about it. Jeremy clapped him on the back. Good man, see you about six. Maybe. That's as good as a yes. I'd best get back, the heat's not letting up, is it? No, at least the cyclone fizzled out. Yes, that was a blessing. David frowned. Are you religious? No, but I believe in God, don't you? David shrugged and blew out a long, deep breath. I'm not sure anymore. Let's have a conversation about that sometime. Jeremy clipped up his helmet and climbed onto his bike. See you tonight. David gave a non-committal wave as he rode off. He doubted he'd go, although Emma's curries were the best, and he hadn't been eating well over the past couple of weeks. Two-minute noodles, frozen meals, baked beans. Homemade curry actually sounded good. But did he want to spend time with Serena's brother, especially if he was going to talk about God? He shrugged. It could be interesting. Maybe he would. After a slow ride back to the apartment he'd shared with Serena for the last six years, he jumped into the shower. When his phone rang while he was toweling his hair, he almost ignored it, but a glance told him it was work. He picked it up and answered. Hey, Dave. It was his boss, Reggie. How do you feel about going south? The New South Wales Fire Service has called for help and I thought you might be keen to go. David brightened. Without hesitating, he answered, Yeah, mate, count me in. He'd been watching the fire situation down south for a while and wondered if a call for help would come. This could be the answer to his time out. Who else is going? Troy and Robbo so far. I'm still contacting everyone. When do they want us? Immediately. So today? Yes, the flight leaves at 3pm. David checked the time. It was only 12, plenty of time to pack. I'll be there. Good man, see you then. That settled that. No curry tonight. He quickly sent Jeremy a text and began packing. Not that he'd need much. There'd be no downtime with a fire front as large as this one. He could already feel the adrenaline building. Chapter 18 Maggie set her coffee mug on the table and gazed across the lagoon. The sun had recently set and the sky was still awash with brilliant oranges, pinks and crimsons. 
she'd come to love this time of evening. It was a time to share the simple pleasures with Frank after he returned from working all day out in the paddocks or the sheds, because even though he'd promised to slow down, he'd gotten straight back into it the day after they returned from their honeymoon. At first, she hadn't been sure what to do with her time. Having taken indefinite leave from her job, and with nothing more specific to be doing other than writing Clara Goddard's biography and spending time with Serena, she'd taken to spending her days engrossed in a good book. But a sense of guilt overtook her whenever she opened one. It almost seemed wrong when she knew how hard Janella and Olivia worked. But she wouldn't intrude. Although she was considering offering her help with the eco-tents if everyone was agreeable, she also wanted to offer money to develop the basic setup into something grander, but was anxious about discussing it with Frank. Like Julian, she believed that Goddard Downs should embrace tourism with open arms. Other stations had successfully incorporated it into their business structure, and she didn't see any good reason why Goddard Downs shouldn't. The only obstacle was Frank. While he was happy dipping his toe in with the overnight cattle drives and eco-tents, he'd refused to discuss anything beyond that. She'd need to choose the right moment to raise the subject with him. The last thing she wanted was to cause any friction between them. But tonight wasn't the time. Something else was on her mind. They'd had their first disagreement that morning. Frank had assumed they'd take all their meals at the homestead. While she was happy to eat there occasionally, she'd assumed they'd mostly have their meals alone at the cabin. It was their home after all, and they were newlyweds. They'd both said words they immediately regretted, and after apologising, they reached a compromise, agreeing to have breakfast and lunch at the cabin and to share dinner twice a week with the family at the homestead. We can always invite them here sometimes, she'd said. I hadn't thought about that, but I guess we could, he'd conceded. They'd just enjoyed their first dinner on their own, and now, with the sky ablaze with colour and the sounds of evening filling the air, she reached out and took his hand across the table. I enjoyed our meal together, Frank. I'm sorry about this morning. He massaged the top of her hand with his thumb as he turned his head, sending a shiver down her spine as their gazes connected. So am I, my love. I shouldn't have gotten so heated. She smiled. Are you really happy to eat here together and not be with the family? Oh, it's an adjustment for sure, but not one I can't make. I hadn't thought about it, that's all. I know not being with the family is a big change for you, so thank you. There's no need to thank me. You're my wife and I love sitting out here with you. But now, what else is on that mind of yours? I can see the cogs ticking. He drew circles on her hand with his finger, his eyes twinkling. Maggie chuckled. For a man, he was quite intuitive. It didn't help that she wore her heart on her sleeve. You're right, I do have a few things on my mind. Do we need another coffee? She chuckled again. <laughs> no. But she smiled at his thoughtfulness. Okay, what have you got? She drew a deep breath. What to raise first? Jeremy's phone call, church, or getting to know the neighbours? She decided to go with the easy one first. Church. Is there any way we can start going to church? I know the closest one is in Kananara, and right now we'd have to take the helicopter, but I'd like to go, if not every week, perhaps every second one. I don't see why not. We could have lunch with Sarah, Mick and Mum and do some sightseeing on the way back. That would be lovely. Thank you. I've missed worship these past couple of months. We should have made the effort to go before now. I guess I've gotten used to not going. But I agree that having regular fellowship is important. The rest of the family might even decide to go. It might be good for them. I sometimes wonder if they shouldn't have more contact with others, especially the kids. Frank's brows twitched. She gulped. Had she overstepped the mark? What right did she have to make comments like that? Four generations had lived here at Goddard Downs and survived. More than survived, thrived. Their family was close-knit. Did they really need contact with outsiders? I'm sorry, Frank, I shouldn't have said that. It's not my place. No, you're right. It would probably do them good. 
Caleb's supposed to be going to boarding school next year, but he doesn't want to go. We all think he should. He's barely had any direct contact with boys his age. He seems to be doing well, though. Frank nodded. Yes, I'm proud of the way he's coming along. That's partly because of you, Frank. I see the way you two get on and it warms my heart so. He's very fortunate to have you as his grandpa. You're too kind, Maggie, but thank you. They shared a moment of silence before she broached the next topic, one she hoped wouldn't open a bag of worms. Do you ever mix with your neighbours? I know they aren't close by, but do you ever get together with them? When Frank drew a slow breath, she wondered if she had overstepped. He stretched his legs and stared at the lagoon. Once again, we used to. When Esther was alive, she used to organise a gathering every few months. Maggie gulped. The bag was well and truly open. I'm sorry, Frank. I seem to be putting my foot in my mouth every time I speak. He swung his gaze to her. No, Maggie, it's fine. We should be able to talk about all these things, and I want you to feel that this is your home. This place is full of memories, that's for sure, and they all hold a special place. But you and I are building our own memories. We need to carve our own path. I'm so glad to hear you say that. So, do you think we could organise a get-together sometime soon? I'd really like to meet our neighbours. He nodded. I think it's a wonderful idea. It's been way too long since we've seen each other. We've been so focused on survival that we've overlooked being neighbourly. I'll speak to Janella and Liv about it tomorrow. She bit back her immediate response. Of course Janella and Olivia should be the ones to organise it. She didn't know the neighbours, but despite that, she'd hoped it could have been her project. She finally said, well, since I mentioned it, I'm happy to help. He patted her hand, and I'm sure they'll welcome it. Now, what's next? She threw her head back and laughed. <laughs> How did you know there was something else? Oh, I have a way. I know you do. She gazed into his blue eyes as she wove her hand into his. It still amazed her that she'd fallen so deeply in love with this man, and he with her. He made her insides turn to flame whenever she stared into his eyes. She almost forgot what she was about to say, but then remembered. Clearing her throat, the words tumbled out. <clears throat> Jeremy telephoned today. He bumped into David this morning, but only a short time later, David got called away to help with the fires down south. Jeremy thought Serena should know he's gone. He also mentioned that David didn't seem to be in a good frame of mind, and he got the feeling he could implode. Not as bad as Cliff, but definitely hurting. She paused and took a breath. It's probably not a good state of mind to be in when fighting fires. You're worried about him? She nodded. He could easily put himself in harm's way, take risks he shouldn't, all because Serena rejected him. I need to talk with her about him, but each time I try, she changes the subject. Frank rubbed her hand. She'll come around, you'll see. I certainly hope so. She's talking about going back to Darwin, but she can't go on her own. Maggie paused before continuing. I'd have to go with her, but I don't want to leave you. Well, I'd go with you, Maggie. But what about the station? The boys would manage without me. Relief filled her. That would be great. I don't want us to be separated, Frank, but I can't leave Serena either. I understand, my love. But you never know, she might decide to stay. Let me chat with her. Maggie smiled. Sharing the responsibility with Frank was such a relief. He was so different from Cliff, who'd barely given her any support with the children. That would be great. She seems to respect you. He chuckled and rubbed the back of his neck. I don't know about that, but at least she's polite with me. She also seems to be getting on with Josh and Sean, so perhaps she might like to help with the cattle drives. Maggie laughed. As far as I know, she's never ridden a horse. He chuckled again. <laughs> well, maybe it's time she learned how. <laughs> so, what's the other thing? Maggie frowned. How did he know she had something else on her mind? She hadn't planned on raising the tourism issue tonight. 
What makes you think there's something else? Oh, I can just tell something's bothering you. Don't ask how. Hmm. She shifted in her chair. Okay. Well, yes, there is something. I'd like to help with the eco-tents. His head angled. I don't see why there'd be a problem with that. That's not all. Maggie swallowed hard. You know, I have money. Frank's brows knitted. Yes? I, I'm not sure I should be saying this. Just say it, Maggie. Okay. You know how I visited a number of other stations when I was doing my research? He nodded. I think I know where this is going. Hear me out. I'm listening. He tapped a finger on the table, his gaze narrowing. She tried to ignore it and continued. A fair number have embraced tourism, like Brampton Downs. That was an amazing place, don't you agree? For a wedding, yes. I think we could do something like that here. Not so grand, but there's a demand for top quality guest lodgings in the Kimberley. I think it would complement the cattle drives and the eco tents, giving people more options. And they'd love it here. She paused. How am I doing? He lifted a brow. If you were pitching to anyone but me, I'd say you were doing great. But you're not going to win me over, Maggie. I don't want Goddard Downs to lose its character. We're a family-run cattle station, not some fancy tourist destination. She tried to disguise her disappointment. I thought you'd say that. That's why I wasn't going to mention it tonight. I'm sorry I pushed. She released a breath. She wasn't going to get anywhere with him, which was such a pity because it could be great. He took both her hands in his and looked deep into her eyes. I appreciate your offer, Maggie, but I don't think it's what the Lord wants for us. Are you sure about that? Are you sure you're not set in your ways and simply don't like change? She kept her voice light and made it sound as if she was teasing him, but part of her did actually think it was true. Well, there's a red flag to a bull, if I might say so. His eyes twinkled. Sorry, I couldn't help it. She chuckled, thankful he hadn't taken her comment seriously. If you change your mind, the offer's there. Thank you. Maybe we can think of a better use for your money. Like what? I'm not sure. Let's pray about it. That's a wonderful idea. And let's pray about all the things we've talked about. There are so many possibilities and things to look forward to. Yes, but as long as we're together, my love, that's all I need. His hand came up to caress her cheek. Oh, Frank, you turn me to mush. He chuckled. And you, my dear, make every day brighter. She laughed. We're just a couple of old romantics, aren't we? Who are you calling old? No one. Good. He squeezed her hand and smiled. Shall we pray? Yes. Maggie bowed her head, and as Frank began to pray, his voice calm and sincere, peace settled over her. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you in awe of who you are. We acknowledge that in you we live and breathe and have our being. We thank you for bringing us together and for the great love we have for each other. But right now, on our hearts are many things. You know them already, but Lord, we bring them to you and ask that you hear our prayers. Firstly, we bring Serena before you. Let her heart be open to you. May she see the depth of your love for her and be comforted by that. Let her see that you have a plan for her and that despite her injuries, her life can have meaning and purpose. We know that, Lord, but we pray that she might see that too. And Lord, we also pray for David. Keep him safe as he fights these terrible fires down south. But more than that, Lord, we pray that he will come to know you as well. That amidst his heartache and confusion, he will turn to you, the great healer. Reveal yourself to him, Lord, we pray. 
And lastly, we commit the future of Goddard Downs to you. You know how much the station means to me and how much the live export ban is hurting us. Show us the way forward and help me to welcome change if that's what's needed. In your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Maggie cleared her throat. Lord, I thank you for bringing Frank into my life. I feel so blessed to have him as my husband. Show me how I can support and help him through these difficult times, and Lord, as Frank has already prayed, we ask that you draw Serena and David to yourself. Open the eyes of their hearts that they might see Jesus and come to experience the peace that comes from a right relationship with you. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. When Maggie opened her eyes, the sky had turned from orange to black and was now filled with twinkling stars. It was almost as if God had held out his hand and scattered them onto a blank canvas like fairy dust. Her heart filled with the assurance that not only had he heard their prayers, but that he would answer them. Chapter 19 David arrived in the small town of Mulladoola on the south coast of New South Wales at midnight. He and ten others from Darwin had flown to Canberra that afternoon and were transported the remaining distance by truck. After a short briefing, they were told to grab a few hours of sleep and report for duty at 4am. Although it was midnight, smoke hung heavily in the air and the horizon was tinged a deep orange. Although it was the middle of the night, the temperature still hovered in the low 30s and the forecast was for another day of extreme temperatures and high winds. The worst combination with the land tinder dry. He bunkered down on a stretcher in the makeshift camp and closed his eyes, but sleep evaded him. The next few days would demand much of him physically, but he was prepared. This was his job, what he'd trained for, and he hoped it would help keep his mind off Serena. When sleep finally came, it was fitful and filled with images of her and the blast that almost killed her in Paris. He hadn't been there when it happened, but the images were so vivid he could have been. He pictured the scene completely and it filled him with immense sadness. Other images besieged his subconscious as well. Another blast. Another fire. So real, yet so far away. The images, locked in his subconscious, only came to him in his dreams. But when he was awake, he knew he dreamed of the fire that killed his mother and siblings, although he couldn't remember it. He'd only been four at the time, and somehow, he and his father had survived. The lights came on at four, turning night into day with the flick of a switch, and ten minutes later, he was dressed and ready to go. The pale fingers of dawn were lighting the night sky when he lined up outside with the other men for breakfast. An eerie quiet filled the air, as if everyone was preparing themselves for what lay ahead. With breakfast over, instructions were given. He was to join the front line along the western side of the ridge. The team's task was to stop the fire from crossing the ridge and entering the town that lay beyond it. The residents in the area had been told to leave, but some had ignored the instructions and had stayed to protect their homes. It was foolhardy. He wasn't a praying man, but he hoped the people would see sense and leave before it was too late. Anyone who thought they could outsmart a raging fire wasn't thinking straight. Frank found Serena sitting on the homestead's veranda the following morning, staring into the distance. Although he wasn't trying to be quiet, she didn't appear to notice his approach until he stood right beside her. Mind if I join you? He asked softly when she looked up. She shrugged offhandedly. I'm not good company. I don't mind. He sat on a rocker and waited for her to speak. Did mum send you? Her gaze narrowed. No. Why are you here then? I thought you might like someone different to chat with. She folded her arms. What I need is time alone. 
Would you like me to go? I didn't say that. Okay. He drummed his fingers on his thighs. She was pricklier than she'd been with him before. Did you know that David's gone south to fight the fires? Her eyes flickered. No, how do you know that? Jeremy saw him before he left and told your mother. Oh, how do you feel about that? We're not together anymore, so it doesn't affect me. Her gaze held steady, as if she were challenging him to disagree. Her eyes were a similar shape and colour to Maggie's, but where Maggie's were often filled with merriment, Serena's held pain. The news affected her greatly, although she wouldn't admit it. It's still okay to care, Serena, he said. She tore her gaze away. Moments passed. Finally, she said softly, Okay, I do care. But I can't marry him now or ever, not looking like this. She lifted a hand to her cheek. I'm sure he doesn't care what you look like. I do, but there's more to it than that. He feels guilty that he and his father were the only ones from his family to survive the fire that destroyed their home when he was four. Oh. Frank angled his head. I didn't know that. Looking after me is his way of dealing with his guilt. And that's why he became a firefighter, Frank said. Yes. I'm sure it wasn't simply guilt that made him propose. She shrugged and shifted in the chair. I don't know. A deep sadness gripped Frank's heart. He hadn't known what happened to David's family. Maggie mustn't have known either, or else she would have told him. But he was sure David loved Serena, and that it wasn't simply guilt that drove him to propose. If only she could open herself to love, and not just the love of a man. To the love of God, who also loved her regardless of what she looked like, because she was his child. Don't waste your life, Serena. You survived that blast when you could have died. You came out of it with scarring, but you're alive. Life is precious, even if you're carrying scars. I'm sure David would want you to see that too. He'd probably give anything to have his family back, much like I'd... He stopped mid-sentence, his words dangling in the air. He was about to say he'd give anything to have Esther back, but that wasn't the right thing to say now that he was married to Maggie. He quickly changed tack. Caleb had survivor's guilt. She frowned. Your grandson? Frank nodded. Yes, for many years he carried the blame for his grandmother's death. He told her the story of the day Esther died in the raging floodwaters. I had no idea. Serena said once he'd finished. Mum never told me. I'm so sorry. Grief does strange things to us and we all react differently. But it doesn't change the fact that things happen all the time. Not many of us get through life unscathed by something or other. Sometimes it takes a while to work through it. And sometimes it's good to talk about it rather than bottling how you feel. I'm sure your psychologist told you that. I only went once, but yes. And have you talked about it? She shrugged. There's not much to talk about. I'm scarred and somehow I've got to deal with it. Put in a nutshell, yes. But it's also a grieving process you're going through. You've suffered a loss much like David did and much like Caleb and I did. You might not think you have lost someone, but you lost your identity or you think you have. But don't let how you look define you. If you do, you've let those terrorists win, and I'm sure you don't want that. I hadn't thought about it that way. Of course I don't. It might take time to get comfortable with how you look, but your mother and I are both praying that one day soon you'll look in the mirror and not even see those scars. Instead, you'll see a beautiful young woman full of potential and God-given talent. He shifted closer and smiled. That's a nice sentiment, but I doubt that will ever happen. It will 
if you see yourself how God does. You know, the the best therapy would be to read the Bible. Serena raised a brow. The Bible? Yes, it's the story of God's amazing love. He doesn't love us because of how we look or what we do or how clever we are. He loves us because we're his children and his love is unconditional. To have real peace, we need to embrace that truth. God loves us just the way we are, warts and all. Serena folded her arms and gazed into the distance. I used to believe in him until I saw all the hatred in the world. Being a journalist, you get to see some horrible stuff. If he's real, I don't understand why he lets it happen. It's not his fault. We live in a fallen world far different to what he'd planned. He gave mankind freedom to choose how to live. If he withdrew that freedom, we'd be no more than puppets. He'll bring the world as we know it to an end one of these days, but in the meantime, he gives everyone the opportunity to choose to live for him. He won't stop all the bad things from happening, but he does give strength to those who trust him to rise above them. She let out a heavy sigh. I need time on my own to work through everything. Since the day I woke up in the hospital, someone's been with me almost 24-7 and I feel suffocated. You're welcome to stay here. There's plenty of space and I'm sure everyone would respect your need to be alone. She offered him a small smile. Thanks. Let me think about it. Sure. And here's something else to think about. The boys are planning a practice cattle drive when the weather allows. Would you be interested? You mean ride a horse? Camp out? He nodded. She crossed her arms. I don't think so. I thought you were the adventurous type. I used to be. I doubt any of the horses would notice your scars. She pursed her lips, but for the first time her eyes held a sparkle. Only a small one but a sparkle all the same. Funny. Think about it? She shrugged. Maybe, I'll see. Frank pushed to his feet. That's all I can ask for. Don't give up, Serena. You've got your whole life ahead of you. Don't let those terrorists snatch it from you. He squeezed her shoulder before leaving, hopeful that his words might have reached her in some small way. Frank's parting words reverberated in Serena's mind. He was right. The terrorists had snatched life as she knew it from her. In an instant, when the blast ripped through that building, everything had changed. Her chin jutted defiantly. What right did they have to destroy the lives of innocent people? It was despicable. They didn't deserve to live. As far as she knew, only two suspects had been arrested and charged. Two. Nineteen people had died and countless others, like her, had been injured. Where was the justice in that? Anger seethed through her as a flock of galahs soared overhead with not a care in the world. What would it be like to live that way? She'd never know. Her face was scarred for life. The doctors had said the redness would fade and future skin grafts might help a little, but the skin would always be rough and deeply rutted. She doubted she'd ever look in a mirror and not be repulsed. That there'd ever be a time when she'd be comfortable in her own skin again. A Bible verse she'd learned long ago drifted into her thoughts. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. She sighed. That might be, but if he looked at her heart right now, he'd only see bitterness and anger. She couldn't continue that way, she knew that. She wouldn't let those terrorists destroy her life. But right now she had no idea how to climb out of the miry pit that held her captive. Perhaps she should stay and go on the cattle drive. She would have jumped at the chance before the blast. Maybe that could be the first step to reclaiming her life. Not that she could ride a horse, and maybe it was silly to think she could. Her ankle wasn't fully healed, and she still felt physically weak. 
but the idea of camping out under the stars did appeal. She and David used to enjoy camping out. In fact, some of their best times together had been when they'd packed their camping gear into the car and headed to the Kakadu or one of the other local national parks. But she wouldn't think about those times because they would make her think of him and thoughts of him made her sad. Her shoulders drooped. It was too late. Frank's news hadn't surprised her. Of course, David would have jumped at the chance to fight those raging fires down south. The more dangerous the fire, the better as far as he was concerned. They'd always argued over that. But then she had no leg to stand on. She'd never been one to avoid risk either. She felt her face. If only she'd been less gung-ho and taken the option to stay further away from the danger zone. But it was too late now. It's never too late, Serena. She straightened. Where had that come from? She looked around, but no one was there. Chapter 20 Later the following morning, after finishing her chores, Maggie grabbed her book and wandered over to the homestead to spend time with Serena. Frank was out on the western boundary checking the fence line with Julian and said he wouldn't be back until dinner. He'd promised to take the full weekend off and they'd fly into Kununurra late Saturday afternoon and stay with Sarah and Mick overnight and then go to church on Sunday before coming home. Although they'd only been back from their honeymoon less than a week, she was already looking forward to the change of scenery. Not that she was unhappy. Not at all. Married life was wonderful. But there was something about knowing she couldn't easily go into town to grab a few items from the grocery store or drop into a cafe for a coffee and a chat with a friend. It was something she would learn to deal with. It was part and parcel of being married to a cattleman. But the thought nibbled at the back of her mind. Would she ever get bored? No, she'd make sure of that. But it would certainly be easier if she was more involved in the day-to-day activities of the station rather than staying at the cabin all day as if she were on vacation. Frank had said he'd speak with Janella and Olivia about organising a get-together with the neighbours, so she could work on that, and she'd also offer her help with the eco-tents. Not that there was much to do to prepare them for the tourist season. Six tents had already been erected, and as far as she knew, they only needed furnishing. Perhaps she could offer to do that. And perhaps she could ask Serena to help her if Serena planned on staying. Everything would change if Serena didn't amend her decision to return to Darwin. Although Frank had said he'd go with Maggie, she knew he'd soon get bored and want to return to Goddard Downs. It had been different when she'd returned from Paris and he'd stayed in town for weeks. He was courting her. Now that they were married, there was no reason for him to go into the city unless it was on business. She sighed as she strolled along the track. She was worrying about all these things when she should be trusting God to work them out. Why was it so hard to do that? She had no doubt about God's love for her and her family, so why did anxiety nibble away at that trust so often? Lord, please help me to trust you more. Don't let my heart grow anxious. Instead, fill it with your peace as I hand all my cares to you. You, Lord, are trustworthy, and I choose to walk in your ways. Please help me to do that each and every day. Rounding the last corner, the homestead came into view. Olivia was outside tending the vegetable garden, while nearby, Isabel and William were running around with the chickens. Their infectious laughter warmed Maggie's heart and made her smile. Olivia glanced up and waved as Maggie approached. Hey Maggie, how are you today? She wiped her brow with the back of her sleeve, smearing dirt on her forehead. Great, thanks. Would you like a hand? That would be lovely, but you'll get dirty. Oh, a bit of dirt never hurt anyone. Stepping through the gate, Maggie pulled up her sleeves and inspected the garden. It was much larger than the average backyard veggie patch, but was filled with all the normal vegetables of beans, tomatoes and sweet corn. 
There was also a greenhouse where seedlings were raised, ready to plant once the wet season ended. What would you like me to do? How would you feel about weeding? It's a never-ending job. Maggie chuckled. I can imagine. Weeds absolutely love this climate. They sure do. Grab some gloves and tools from the shed and start wherever you want. I'll have to finish up soon. I'm sorry, I've got a call coming in from a supplier I need to take. No problem. I can work on my own for a while. Great, thank you. I don't seem to get enough time these days to look after it properly. Maybe I can help, Maggie said. Olivia's face brightened. Would you? That would be fantastic. We've been so busy preparing everything for the tourist season. An extra pair of hands would be great. Yes, I'd love to. But I'll need to brush up on my gardening skills. It's been a while. Oh, I'm sure you'll be fine. But I can give you a rundown of what we're growing if you'd like. I'd like that, but no hurry. I'm sure I can tell the weeds from the vegetables. (sighs) Yes, that's not too hard. Olivia chuckled as she returned to mulching. As Maggie slipped on a pair of gloves and started pulling weeds, she wondered if perhaps Serena might also be interested in helping. It would be something different for her, although she probably wouldn't want to get her hands dirty. She took after Cliff in that regard, but there was no harm in asking. But what if she left? Maggie grimaced as anxiety began to weigh her down again. She'd just promised Olivia she'd help, but what if she couldn't fulfil that promise? Perhaps she shouldn't have been so quick to offer. The gate swung open and the children stumbled down the narrow path to where Olivia was mulching the beans. Tears streamed down their cheeks. Straightening, Olivia folded her arms and asked what had happened. (laughs) Izzy pushed me over. (laughs) Three-year-old Will sobbed, looking at his sister with a narrowed glare. Did you, Isabel? No, no. Harriet was chasing me and I ran into Willy by accident. A chook was chasing you, she nodded. Are you sure about that? Yes. You weren't doing anything to upset it? She was, Will said. She was chasing them around. Olivia turned to Isabel. Were you? Isabel's bottom lip quivered as she nodded. (laughs) Yes. Maggie chuckled to herself. She couldn't help it. Olivia spoke sternly. Isabel, you owe Will an apology. And I've told you not to chase the chooks. They'll stop laying eggs if you do. Nodding, Isabel turned to Will and wiped her cheeks. (laughs) I'm sorry, Willie. It's okay, he said, reaching out to give her a hug. Maggie's heart warmed as she watched the pair and all of a sudden a longing to see her own grandchildren filled her. Little Chloe was still tiny, but Sebastian would love it out here. She could picture him running around with Will and Isabel having a ball, as long as they didn't chase the chooks. Maybe Jeremy and Emma could come for a visit when the rain stopped. It was funny, because until this week, the reality of living so far from them hadn't truly sunk in. But she no longer lived close by, And although she could FaceTime with them, she couldn't cuddle them whenever she wanted. And that only made her miss them more. But she could give Serena a hug. As Olivia removed her gloves and shepherded the children through the gate, Maggie followed. I hope you don't mind, Olivia, but I need to see Serena. I'll do some more weeding a little later if that's okay. That's not a problem at all. I think she's still on the veranda. Frank was with her earlier. Yes, he said he'd try to see her. She's not doing too well, is she? No, but I have hope. We're all praying for her. Maggie smiled. Thank you, that means so much. When they reached the house, Olivia paused. I think we'll go in the back way, the kids have got muddy feet. Okay, I'll catch you later. Sure. Olivia began walking, but then stopped and turned. Why don't you join us for lunch today since the men are all out? Maggie smiled. Oh, that would be nice. Thank you. Good. I'll let Janella know. Thanks. Maggie stood and watched until the trio headed around the side of the house. Isabel and Will seemingly having forgotten their spat as they skipped along either side of their mother. It wasn't what she'd planned, 
but lunch with the girls might be just what she needed. And it might even be what Serena needed. Slow Path to Peace continues in Volume 3, Chapters 21 to 30. Click the link below to keep listening.